welcome to the Capital Discussions Roundtable. I'm Tom Nunnemaker with our host, Gareth Ryan, uh, who's in London. Before we get started, uh, Capital Discussions is not a broker, dealer, or an investment advisor. This presentation is for educational purposes only. If you don't know your situation and have no way of knowing the level of risk is appropriate for you. We're not making any specific trade recommendations. The risk of loss in trading options can be substantial, so please be aware of all of your risks prior to placing any trades. Hypothetical computer simulated trades are believed to be accurately represented. However, actual profit or loss may vary due to market factors such as liquidity, slippage, and commissions. And just a reminder, this is for educational purposes only. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and pass the presenter role over to Gareth. And make sure you're unmuted. So welcome, Gareth. It's the first time you've uh, been with our group with uh, Capital Discussion, so uh, welcome. I hope everybody enjoys the presentation and maybe can tell a little bit about yourself and what you do. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is uh, Gareth at IUR Capital. I'm going to be presenting uh, today's uh, webcast for Tom and the folks at Capital Discussions. Um, this is our first webcast with, um, with Tom and everyone else, so let's hope it goes well and they can invite us back. Um, I want to start off with a sign check for everyone. Tom mentioned that uh, some of you are in the U.S. and Canada and others are overseas. Um, folks, we're doing this event from London in the U.K. Um, so over on the right of your WebEx screen, you can use the chat panel to let me know if your audio is uh, working loud and clear. Okay? You can also let me know where you're listening in from, your uh, city and country, if you are in the U.S. or if you are overseas uh, as well. Okay, so folks, it looks like we've got a quite a nice group um, for today's event. Um, this event, I believe, is being recorded, so you can watch the playback later. And it you can is. Also yep, okay, and you can also request the slides for today's event um, after as well. Okay, all right, so um, Klaus, thanks for coming along. Uh, you're in Germany, as is Tom, I believe. Um, okay, Robert's in Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, thanks for all of you to uh, join us for today. So over on the left of your WebEx screen, um, this is going to be an interactive webinar, folks. So um, we're going to leave the, the chat open for Q&A at any time. I will try to get as many questions answered as I can. And uh, yes, folks, I, I am aware the, the audio is a little bit scratchy on my headset here. So we'll look into that for um, the next event. But in the meantime, um, we can get through today's event. So, um, as I mentioned, over on the left is the cover slide for uh, today's event. That's uh, Option Strategies for 2017. This is an intermediate to advanced level event, so I will uh, skip through most of the fundamentals um, and uh, some of the basic elements of, uh, of today's event were appropriate. Before I do that, um, as a matter of housekeeping, um, I know Tom has given you a little risk disclosure, but we have our own as well, and um, that is a uh, risk disclosure slide. Here we go. Okay, so um, options are leveraged products that involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. Uh, before you commit your capital to any option strategy, please ensure you've read the characteristics and risks of the standardized options provided by the OIC, and you can obtain a copy on that link. Um, IUR is an investment advisor firm registered with the SEC as an RIA and also regulated by the UK Financial Conduct Authority. Uh, we do not hold any client funds. Client accounts are held at a FINRA regulated broker, dealer and clearing firm. Neither the presenter, that's myself, or IUR is a FINRA registered representative. And of course, IUR is not affiliated with any FINRA broker dealer. We do not receive any uh, incentive to recommend or refer you to any particular broker dealer, okay? Even if we do use one or more broker dealers ourselves. None of the content discussed in this presentation will carry an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any security or operate any specific strategy. Uh, any securities included in this presentation are, of course, for illustrative purposes only. Um, execution fees for U.S. option contracts will vary based on broker dealer, and where multi-leg strategies, including spreads, are discussed, the execution fee is generally per leg, and therefore multiple will commissions apply. Please consider that when looking at spread strategies, which I know a lot of you are. Uh, now, the information that, provided, that we provide in this presentation 
is believed to be accurate, but the accuracy and completeness of the information is not guaranteed. And of course, you as an investor should not rely on any information for the maintenance of your books and records or for tax accounting, financial or regulatory reporting. And lastly, past performance is not indicative of future results. You can request a copy of these slides um, either during the webinar on that email address or at the end. Okay? Now, folks, as I mentioned, this is our first event with, um, with the folks at Capital Discussions, and I do hope they have us back. But here's a brief profile on myself. For anyone here that hasn't been to uh, one of our webcasts before, either um, here or elsewhere, um, folks, I'm the founder and managing director here at IE War Capital. Um, and as you can see, um, I began my trading career at a very young age. Um, back in 2007, I set up IE War uh, to be an investment advisory um, firm for US clients and also for clients here in Europe as well. We specialize in option strategies, as you will uh, get to know. As I mentioned, um, we are an investment advisor for our clients on the Interactive Brokers TWS Advisor platform. Okay, that's where the majority of our advisory business is done for uh, retail investors like uh, anyone joining today's event. Okay, and in fact, we will be using uh, the IB platform for a few moments during today's pre uh, presentation. Okay, any questions on my profile, folks? Please do let me know um, if you have any questions about what we actually do here. You can use the chat panel uh, for that as well. Okay, so um, folks, I know as I mentioned, this is our first event with um, with Capital Discussions. I did want to give all of you um, a brief background in terms of our performance um, for the full year 2016. Uh, 2016 was the first full year for us that we actually reported performance of any particular strategy. Um, in this case, folks, what I'm talking about is the S&P 500 index credit spread uh, strategy. Now, if I bring you over to this slide, um, what you should see is, firstly, the, um, uh, uh, the, the cumulative return figure over on the right. It may be a little bit uh, hazy, but it's, that figure is 50.48% uh, for the full year from January to December uh, 30. Okay. Um, over on the left, you can see a comparison of the performance on the credit spread using uh, the blue line as our strategy performance and the green line down here being the SPX benchmark. This strategy does one thing and one thing only. It harvests premium on the S&P using both weeklies and monthlies with either put spreads or call spread premium being sold on a continuous basis. Okay, um, I do have a account statement I can provide to all of you as I mentioned um, on the previous slide. Uh, but as I mentioned, this is our first full year of reporting performance for 2016 on any given strategy. Okay, so it was a very good year for us overall. I hope that a lot of you also managed to take advantage of the opportunities when they presented themselves in 2016 on SPX and those other index products. And we're going to talk to you more about this performance and a few other things, of course, during today's webcast and uh, elsewhere as well. Okay, so as I mentioned, you can request the actual brokerage account statement for what I've just shown you um, by emailing me directly at some point after today's webinar. Okay, moving on. Okay, so opportunities for 2017. As I mentioned, I'm aware that most of you are in the intermediate or higher uh, level in terms of knowledge, so I'm going to skip through most of uh, the basics um, where, you, where you see them in, in today's webcast and focus more on the specifics with regards to uh, premium harvesting. Folks, here we are at the beginning of 2017 after a 10% move in SPX last year. I've got a couple of charts to go through with you that, uh, where I'll talk about that, but opportunities for this year. Um, our outlook for 2017 in terms of equity index is, is something similar to last year. In that, I mean, our target for the equity index is somewhere between 5 and 10%, okay? At best, 12 to 14% on SPX. Um, we've had a reasonably solid start to the year, as you can see, for equity indexes. And in fact, today, as you know, we've got the Dow above 20,000 for the first time, and SPX setting another all-time high. Um, 
That being said, we generally as a firm are not a directional bias kind of firm. What I mean by that is we're not really going out there and taking long gamma um, positions, being a call buyer or being a put buyer and looking to be right about direction, paying a dollar for an option, selling it for two. That's, of course, a different type of business. We've got some clients that do want to do that with us, but the main part of our business, as I mentioned, is in premium harvesting and in particular using the credit spread strategy, which I hope most of you will be familiar with, um, on index options. As you know, with the credit spread, and as you'll see with my upcoming slides, they really are used, the credit spread, for bull, bear, or neutral uh, markets. And that's the great thing about um, uh, using neutral or market neutral strategies like the credit spread. As I mentioned last year, folks, option buyers, in many cases saw their asset wasting in value, okay? Particularly where they're using weeklies or front month options to be long gamma uh, without that directional move. This of course is where uh, you have to take into consideration one very simple fact about the options market. Approximately 80% of all listed options expire out of the money, okay? About 80% of all options uh, in existence on listed markets will expire out of the money. Now. Of course, you want to be a part of that 80%. If you are a seller premium, you do not want to be a, a buyer of that figure um, when you are taking directional strategies. Of course, when you do get a move, if you are a buyer of gamma, a buyer of premium, and you do get that directional move, you have the opportunity to capitalize much sooner than the seller as a long gamma position. So I'll talk to you a little bit more about that um, in the upcoming slides. As I mentioned, I have a couple of charts I want to get through with all of you. Um, and in fact, we use charts in most of our webcasts for a very simple reason. They give us a good idea of, of perspective uh, when it comes to equity indexes. So this is the one year on the S&P. Um, folks, this time last year, I know some of you will likely be trading on a daily basis. We started off 2016 with a very nasty 12% correction, as you can see over in the, the bottom left of the screen on SPX. From the very first trading day, of last year all the way through to Feb 11, okay? Now, Feb 11, as you may know last year, was the bottom for global equity indexes. Oil firstly bottomed in late Jan of last year. Equity indexes on that Thursday, Feb 11, that was the day that perhaps we will remember most about 2016. Not the Brexit sell-off, not the presidential election, but Feb 11 for its own reasons because the V-bottom formation that we saw right over here, that led to a very aggressive V bottom and a rally above the previous highs, up to about 2,200 um, throughout the, the rest of 2016. As I mentioned, we did have a V bottom again on Brexit, but it was a much more shallow near-term uh, negative reaction to, uh, to that uh, UK referendum in mid-summer. Okay, then again, we hit new highs up to 2,225. Then we have what is traditionally known as the summer doldrums. Volatility drops. That means intraday moves in SPX are dropping. Um, and we have a sideways period, which actually is great, obviously, for the Iron Condor folks in the room or for anyone taking market neutral strategies again because between early July and early, uh, let's say, early uh, September, we had a period where realized vol was at its lowest for perhaps several decades. And you can see that with the moves on SPX. Early September comes and we do get a, a little bit of a sell-off. Again, we pull back to the 2100 level. And then we finish the year after the election outcome, we finish the year on a very solid basis at all time highs. So that's where the 10% move in SPX came from last year. You can see very clearly where are the three opportunities to be a seller of put spread premium last year. The 12% correction at the beginning of the year, the V bottom on Brexit, which is a much more immediate opportunity, and which only lasted a couple of days, folks. It was the Friday of the referendum and the following Monday. On the Tuesday of the following week, that's when the recovery started. So it was a much more short-term uh, negative reaction to, uh, to that event. Then we had another one at the beginning of September, which was also pretty shallow. It was about a 3 to 4% decline uh, during the first three days of September. Okay, now if you look at the performance chart, as I mentioned, if I bring you briefly back here, some of you may say, okay, that looks great, uh, that strategy performance, 
and you can see where the returns are. But what is this drawdown here? Folks, that's a weekly expiry being uh, adjusted through a roll down and a roll out. Okay? So we went from about 48% to the mid-20s um, in early September. The great thing for us, of course, is that through our adjustments, we managed to recover all of that uh, in the following weeks okay, with the continued use of hedging. I'm going to talk to you more about that in the details of this in the upcoming slides. Okay, below that, of course, you've got the MACD. Some of you are MACD followers. It's something that obviously any technical, um, um, technically minded investor should look at as well uh, to give you oversold and overbought conditions. Something we look at as well on our side, but perhaps not leaning so much weight on that, uh, particular, uh, that particular technical indicator. Okay, all right. Now, historical versus implied or realized versus implied. Um, Anyone in the options market will know just how important volatility is, in particular implied vol, which to us and to you should be more important than the realized, although realized in itself is also important. Um, again, you can see the contrast here between realized and the implied on a one-year basis. Back at the beginning of last year, uh, we had implied in the mid-20s. Uh, that means the VIX being up in the mid-20s. Where are we today on implied, folks? We're actually, I believe, we're today we're touching the all-time low on the VIX, which is hard to imagine in mid-January. Normally, that's something you would see in mid-summer. Um, so here we are below 11, which I believe is for the first time on the volatility index. You can say what you want about that in terms of your outlook for volatility. But we know what that means for option pricing. And you know that it's better to be an option buyer than an option seller if you are taking volatility plays with uh, implied vol below 11. Now, that doesn't mean that being a seller premium is off the table with a VIX below 11, but it does mean that you need to factor in your short Vega exposure, of course, uh, when you're selling Vega and selling premium at these levels on the vol. So some crossover on the realized against the implied. Um, of course, we end the year near the lows on the implied, and the realized also follows it lower. Uh, but again, you can see the three peaks on the realized at the beginning of the year, during midsummer with the Brexit outcome and another retest in September, the early part of uh, September. What do we know about the volatility index, folks? Um, again, about 80 to 85% of the time, the volatility index moves inversely to the SPX index. Okay, so it's not entirely accurate in terms of daily moves that you see on the two products. Um, but you can rely on it to, to a certain extent with regards to market sentiment and the metric of risk uh, in terms of its action. Um, on a daily basis. So that's a good thing to look out for, the realized versus the implied. Um, anyone, as I mentioned, that is taking volatility plays wants to know about uh, both of these uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Okay? Now, folks, this is not a volatility-based webinar, but as I mentioned, uh, the vol is something that anyone here uh, that's focused on uh, running an option strategy um, on a full-time basis needs to know about on an almost daily basis. Okay, let's move on to the one year in SPX again. This time we're looking at premium opportunities. Well, as I mentioned on the first slide, we can count three opportunities only where you have more than a 3 to 4% move outside of one uh, standard deviation on the SPX for the year. Again, early January and early February, mid June and early September. Apart from that, again, you can see a lot of sideways action. That's where you want to ask yourself the question, what kind of option strategy will work there? Well, as I mentioned, uh, um, a lot of you will be iron condor people out there. Um, yes, they can certainly work, uh, provided that you've got your strike selection and your time horizon uh, correct, but you don't want to be in a situation where you're having to adjust uh, your ICs, especially on the weekly ICs, um, on, a, on a frequent basis, because then you know it's not really working in terms of net credit. You're giving back too much on a regular basis to make it worthwhile uh, where you have to adjust one side of the IC on the weeklies. A lot of retail investors, folks, will use weekly ICs for their own reasons uh, to take mark market neutral setups. And as I mentioned, that period of about nine weeks between early July and early September of last year, in the middle of this chart, that was the most prolonged period throughout 2016 where near-term premium could be harvested, harvested using both the weeklies and the, uh, uh, the monthlies. Okay? Folks, as you all know, from September of last year, we not only have weeklies now, we've also got mid-weeklies. Okay? So the choice 
for you continues to grow. You've got your monthlies, your weeklies, and now your midweeklies. That means that in any given month, if you really are active, hyperactive, hypergamma as we could say here, the fatter of gamma, you could have two expiries every week and then the monthly, which means in any given month you could have eight or nine expiries to choose from. You can call those premium opportunities if you are a seller of gamma uh, on SPX or indeed any equity index. Okay? So any questions on that, let me know. Um, but as I mentioned, you can see very clearly where the three opportunities are to harvest premium last year. It's going to be very interesting to see what 2017 looks like uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of premium harvesting. Okay? All right, so let's move on here. Now, I know a lot of you have just joined us on our I can see the, the groups gradually getting larger. Always great to see you, even if it is uh, um, a few minutes after we've started. Um, so again, you can request the slides for today's event um, during the event or after you've got my email address on this particular slide. So the zero rate effect, I'm not going to talk to you too much about the macro picture on interest rate policy, folks, but you should all know that for 2017, the market is trying to price in at least two or three rate hikes. Okay, it's a given that we'll have at least one during the first half of the year and possibly two by midsummer. Whether we get a third one, uh, again, that's something that anyone dealing in, in treasuries will have to, uh, uh, to consult you on. Um, but it is something we follow, of course, using several products. How those rate hikes are going to affect the market is obviously something that you also need to factor in. We've got this presidential uncertainty out of the way uh, to a certain extent, um, although you can argue that Every time the president takes to the, uh, the podium, he creates his own volatility. Uh, no jokes about that, please. Um, so the zero rate effect on volatility, as I mentioned, we've had a six, seven year run now with almost zero rates. Uh, we're coming to the end of that now, as you know. We'll probably be somewhere between 1% on to 2% on the, uh, on, the, um, on the headline rate by the end of this year. Uh, factor that in. Understand that uh, for this year, things may not be so clear-cut when it comes to when uh, we get rate hikes. Okay, That, of course, is going to feed into uncertainty and volatility and the VIX. Remember what the historical mean is for the VIX. It's mid-20s, isn't it? Anyone here that's been in the business in the options market for long enough will know where the historical mean is. It's significantly above where we are right now. In fact, it's about, we are about 50% right now of, of the historical mean on volatility. Okay. Um, sitting at 10 or 11, folks, as I mentioned, that has a material impact on option pricing and, of course, on the SKU uh, with regards to option pricing. So that's something to consider. Um, as I mentioned, our target for this year, something similar to last year on SPX, that's 8 to 10%. Um, we're not looking for a spectacular year overall. Um, anything, folks, from negative 10% to positive 10%, we're pretty happy with for this year in terms of SPX. Uh, in fact, we're pretty confident that we can repeat our credit spread strategy performance, uh, as I mentioned on this particular slide. We're pretty confident we can repeat this in 2017, assuming, of course, several factors, including market conditions and volatility. Okay, so once again, anyone that has joined us late, this is what we're going to be talking about today, uh, not just our 2016 performance, but of course, how we're going to try and repeat that for next year. Okay, that's 50% return net of fees in 2016. So we're going to get to um, a couple of important things. Folks, I'm going to skip through these couple of slides because as I mentioned, um, most of you are, I could consider, intermediate or higher in terms of knowledge base. Um, but it, it should be considered that some of you will have a large portfolio, relatively speaking, where you have some traditional assets in there and you're looking to increase your, your premium or to seek income on a regular basis. Of course, that's what premium harvesting strategies are about. In that case, 15 to 20% of that overall portfolio could be allocated to a conservative option strategy like the credit spread to generate regular premium. Okay? Monthly targets are great. If you can achieve them, you're not going to always going to achieve them, of course. Um, but that, of course, is where the, uh, uh, the credit spread comes in. You've always got another opportunity right around the corner, especially, as I mentioned, now that we have both weeklies and midweekly expiry on equity index options. Scenario two, well, a lot of you will have IRAs or retirement accounts in the U.S. or overseas, the equivalent of a pension, um, which should be conservatively structured. It should not be, of course, 
invested in aggressive option strategies. However, considering an option strategy that seeks to harvest premium and that does not require directional bias, again, using the, the, the credit spread or the butterfly, uh, which we're going to talk about in the next few slides, could be considered for such a, an account type and such a structure. So again, this is where you've got two scenarios. I know a lot of you may fit into this. Some of you may not. Um, again, the great thing about option strategies and what we do with our clients is that it's not one size fits all. But one option strategy can be used by one or more types of investor, OK? OK, so a quick point about 2013. Folks, in 2013, um, there was one particular hedge fund manager um, who you may know. His name is David Tepper from Appalachia Capital Management. Folks, the SPX did 30% in 2013. David Tepper brought in about $3 billion with a B for himself in 2013. Most of that is relying on the rally on SPX and to some extent on the Russell 2000 index. Um, that was a good year for Mr. Tepper. I'm not sure how he did last year. Um, but what I would say to you is we're not expecting a repeat of uh, that year in 2013. Remember, that was the height of QE. QE was basically on fire um, in 2013, and that's where we saw the rally, particularly um, in the last part of the year. Uh, we actually rallied significantly going into year end in 2013. There were pockets of volatility along the way, um, but as I mentioned, don't expect a repeat of that year. What does that mean for, uh, for 2017? Well, as I mentioned, we're looking for 2017 just to resemble something like 2016 um, in terms of opportunities on increased volatility and opportunities to harvest premium um, with the right approach to risk. So again, this is our first webcast with uh, capital discussions. We're going to get through a lot today, but not everything when it comes to volatility-based strategies. Here's a very simple breakdown for all of you that you should consider when it comes to income seeking against volatility strategies. Remember, you can apply both to your portfolio. Uh, some of you may be leaning more towards premium harvesting. That's good to hear because, of course, that's what the credit spread strategy that I, I talked about uh, is, is focused on, along with, of course, the more traditional income seeking strategies like the covered call and, of course, the iron condor. The butterfly, folks, is something that we're going to talk to you more about today, except it's going to be a hybrid version uh, when I bring you into uh, the platform and we go through a couple of examples. Meanwhile, over on the right, you've got long straddle, long strangle, and of course, the long put. Remember, as I mentioned, that some of you have joined us late. I talked earlier about the fact that here we are today with a VIX below 11. Okay, I believe that from record is the all-time low when it comes to volatility. And of course, the metric of risk for the S&P 500 index. If that's the case, then you perhaps could consider taking a long volatility position on the on the, the outlook that you know vol is not going to go any lower than where it is right now because we are at very complacent levels if you want to form an opinion about volatility in the low teens as I mentioned earlier as well anyone that's been in the options business for long enough will know that the mid 20s and the low 20s is more uh, where we see the historical mean the longer term historical average so we're significantly below those levels. The question, of course, is are we going to see those levels again? Um, one thing is for sure, folks, not much is guaranteed in life, but the market will get a sell-off at some point. Okay, we will see a sell-off on equity indexes. How often that happens and when it happens, of course, is the important question uh, for everyone in the room. Okay, when it happens, of course, that's where volatility uh, comes alive. Okay? Okay, so this particular chart is more related to uh, uh, basic to intermediate level, so I won't spend too much time on it. But basically, it forms path dependency. Um, it provides you with path dependency in terms of the four factors looking out for strategies um, uh, to use in 2017. Market conditions, remember that not all option strategies will be suitable for um, uh, foreign market conditions. If you're sideways on your outlook, well, of course, you don't want to be taking directional um, option positions. You don't want to be a buyer of gamma, better to be a seller of gamma, either on the near-term weeklies or on that front month uh, traditional monthly expiry. Strike selection, of course, translates directly into your risk profile. How much delta risk do you want to take on? How much gamma do you want to be selling on that delta? Uh, underlying security, well, folks, here's the thing about what we do here at IUR. Um, we're not a stock picker and we never, we never have been and never will be. 
um, as an options firm, an investment firm that specializes in option strategies. Um, we focus less on single names to use as our underlying securities, and we focus more on a small basket of underlying securities that is primarily index-based or ETF-based. Um, so our basket right now is anywhere between five and ten names. As I mentioned, SPX being one of them. Spider, the RUT, IWM, NDX, the Qs, TLT, um, again, all part of our basket, basket of underlying index products. Okay, generally as a firm, what we're trying to do is reduce our company specific risk. And of course, that's the whole benefit of using index options. Time horizon was, I mentioned as well. Uh, folks, with the advent of the new midweekly series on index products, you now have an even greater choice in terms of time horizon. Okay, if you want to be a very near term seller of gamma, uh, I use that term hyper gamma because that's really what weekly options are about now. Um, then you can take on short gamma premium with a very near term time horizon, or you can reduce some of your gamma risk using uh, those traditional monthlies. Okay. Okay, so a couple of things with regards to the advantages of the credit spread and why this strategy is going to be our focus. It was our focus in 2016, um, and as you can see from the uh, from the performance, again, some of you have joined us today, folks. This is the 2016 credit spread strategy performance. Um, on SPX. This is a firm prop account. Okay, the, the, the funds being used in this uh, uh, this uh, broker account is entirely to us as a firm where we operated the credit spread strategy and only the credit spread strategy in the account using SPX or in this case, uh, Spider ETF. So that's how the returns were generated. Um, as I mentioned, if you've got any questions about that, um, you can request the slides and the brokerage account statement um, after uh, today's webcast. But as I mentioned, we're going to continue to focus on the credit spread. Why is that? Well, as, as you can see, time decay, taking a lack of direction with the underlying, and of course, uh, taking some volatility exposure as a seller of premium. Those are the three things that we focus on with regards to the credit spread. I know, I know some of you are diagonal players as well, uh, along with ICs, and uh, perhaps some calendars in there. Um, again, market conditions are they have a major impact on what kind of strategy we're going to be using. Um, but right now, market conditions are very favorable for anyone harvesting premium, either through uh, short put spreads, short call spreads, a traditional butterfly or a traditional iron condor. Any of those are uh, um, appropriate for current market conditions. A brief reminder of the structure of that spider ETF relative to SPX. Some of you have been to my webcast before and asked me about the advantages of both of these. Folks, Spider ETF is, of course, an ETF, which means it's physically settled, whereas SPX is purely a cash instrument. That's the big difference. And, of course, the fact there is a dividend on uh, Spider ETF as well. So you can own it outright as part of a larger equity portfolio. Okay? Okay, so a couple of things about what we're doing here in terms of seeking income. Remember uh, that, uh, again, this is an intermediate to advanced level event, so I'm not going to talk to you too much about the basics you're familiar with the concept of vertical spreads and what, what they are and how they're structured with regards to the same underlying, same expiration, and different strike prices being used where premium is being received on the opening transaction as a credit. Okay. Now, here's what we're going to look at. Um, and I use this, in fact, with most of my webcasts, this example of a 5% monthly income target. That doesn't necessarily mean, folks, you're going to achieve a 5% monthly income month in, month out. What it does mean is you're setting yourself a target and you have to decide how to achieve that target based on the amount of risk being taken. Okay? Um, so the example is on Spider ETF, as I mentioned. Um, selling a 5% out of the money put spread on the month leads. $5 spread. Folks, we have a preference for $5. Uh, I know a lot of you will, will sell $10 premium. Um, again, that, that's entirely up to you um, with regards to how wide you want the strikes. But in this case, if we're a seller of a $5 spread for $0.50 cents credit, well, really, we're looking to achieve about a 10% um, uh, return on risk there, okay? Because we're picking in, we're bringing in about 10% of the maximum value of the spread itself. The price range, of course, that'll be a maximum 5% decline on the underlying index. This time, it's Spider ETF. Remember that you're neutral to modesty bullish. Some of the folks that come along to these webcasts, they assume that, Selling another the money put spread means you're bullish. Well, to some extent, yes, but 
it's a modestly bullish outlook because, of course, you can afford to be wrong about direction to a certain extent and still keep the premium where both legs of that put spread expire out of the money. Okay? Now, what I want to do actually is go through, um, let me bring you through to uh, what I really want to focus on today for anyone here that's intermediate to advanced. That's the one by three. Now, um, there is more than one name you can give to a one by three setup, folks. Uh, but very simply, you can call it a hybrid um, iron butterfly if you like, um, or a broken wing butterfly because it has, um, it has characteristics of both in essence. But here's the structure before I bring you into the platform where we can see this. So what we have here is a ratio being set up on a traditional monthly expiry on spider. Now, a lot of you try to establish positions at zero capital outlay or near zero capital outlay. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve here. So simple structure is three put spread being sold out of the money, one put spread being bought at the money or closer to at the money. Now, it can be established near zero capital outlay or perhaps a small net debit. And in fact, some cases, if you go far enough out of the money, you should be able to establish with a small credit, okay? Here's the thing, folks. The objective is to extract the credit. This is why I call it premium extraction. You're really achieving your credit upon the seal of the hedge. Now, in the chart above, the, the P&L graph, this simulates exactly how it works. The blue line is your starting point on the underlying security price. This is Spider, remember. Purely, for example, okay, for illustrative purposes only. Spider being the blue starting point. Look what happens to what, uh, your P&L, okay? At expiry, where your hedge is being held all the way to expiry and your put spreads are still being held out of the money, your short put spreads over on the left. Folks, the green area is what we call the honey trap um, relative to what the butterfly looks like. Remember, folks, Anyone doing a butterfly is basically short the wings. Uh, in, in fact, some cases short the meat along the wings if they're a seller, okay? In this case, the honey trap scenario was established where the hedge strikes are in the money, okay? Meanwhile, the short put spreads that you sold out of the money uh, expire out of the money at zero. That's essentially what you're looking to achieve here. Now, here's the thing. That very rarely happens, okay? The real world folks, is, is a little bit different because you're not going to have a scenario where uh, you, your hedge automatically makes money every single time while your short put spreads expire out of the money. I can tell you folks, in all the time we've been doing this, uh, in many cases the hedge is being sold at a loss. But here's the great thing. Remember you're establishing this at a zero capital outlay or a very small net debit. Okay? When I bring you into the platform, you'll see how this works in a, in a real scenario on the spider ETF. But essentially, folks, you can allow the hedge to lose some of its value and still extract a credit on the overall position from the proceeds of that hedge being sold. Of course, that assumes that the put spreads that you sold over here on the left do expire out of the money, okay? The other thing to bear in mind here, and I wanna to talk to you about this as well, is um, the weeklies against the monthlies, the scenario will differ between both. On the weeklies, folks, what you'll find is that you're normally establishing this at a, a net debit, okay? And you're moving into a net credit at the point of the hedge being sold. On the monthlies, it's a different scenario because on the monthlies, things are a little bit quieter, okay? You don't have as much gamma risk if you're a seller of gamma in this case. Uh, remember that we are short a little bit of skew here as well um, with this because we do have some downside exposure. Now, on the monthlies, folks, what you'll find is that you can be selling 5%, 6% out of the money premium, okay, on those put spreads, hedging at the 1% level or even 2% out of the money and still have a scenario where you're either zero capital outlay or you're establishing this at an, at an even better scenario. You're establishing this at a small net credit, okay? Remember, the hedge can uh, uh, decline in value below your cost basis and you can still extract a credit. Your premium extraction is achieved at the point where the hedge is being sold. The question I know a lot of you that are familiar with this is asking, when do you actually sell the hedge? Well, folks, remember, this is about balancing the position, okay? This is not the kind of thing that you just, you just put on and walk away. This type of setup, the one by three has to be managed, especially if you're doing this on the weeklies, okay? 
that means that you may have to adjust your, your hedge by selling a portion of it sooner than you expected, okay? Because you know that you've got that break even point. All right, now, what I wanna do here is I'm gonna share my uh, screen with you for a couple of moments so that we can see exactly how this works in a real world scenario using Spider ETF as our, uh, as our example, okay? We've got some weekly and some monthlies. Uh, the screen will appear in just a second. Here we go. Okay, so folks, if you can see the screen, use the chat panel to let me know. I wanna make sure all of you can see this. Um, this is the uh, the option for the window. Tom, maybe you can just confirm with everyone that we are switched yep, over. Yep, I see it. Great. Okay, so folks, this is the option for the window of the TWS platform, okay? Now, um, what we've got here is, basically, we've got a couple of short put spreads on a hedge. Now. Remember that we are a proponent of using both the weeklies and the monthlies with the one by three setup. So what we've got here is on the Feb 10, okay, that's a weekly expiry. It's about 16 days to expiry on that. You can see very simply what the setup is. We're a seller of the 215 half, 220 half put spread. Okay, so we're a seller of that. It's trading at about 10 cents right now. Uh, we were a seller in the mid 20s yesterday, okay, uh, on that. Now, that's good news for us, obviously, that it's moving closer towards zero. But, of course, we also have the hedge here on a 1 by 3 ratio where we have bought the 221, 226 put spread. And we've paid about 70 cents for it. Um, now, let's take a look at this from the top. We brought in about 25 cents for each put spread being sold here. Okay? Now, if I basically do a very simple calculation here for all of you, you'll see exactly how this works. So if I sell three of those at 25, of course that brings in about a 75 cent net credit, okay? So we bring that in initially. Now, at some point later, during the same trading session, not overnight or immediately, what we've done is we've taken out this 221, 226 hedge on a one by three ratio. So again, what's the cost basis here? Well, that cost us about 70 cents, okay? So it's very simple. We brought in 75, but we've paid out about 70 for that hedge on the one by three. So here's your opening credit. It's a very small opening credit in this scenario. What does that mean for us in real dollar terms and real premium? Well, very simple. Here we are, as I mentioned, 16 days to expiry. This put spread is moving further out of the money. Good news for us. But this hedge is also moving south on us. What we can't do is allow this hedge to lose too much of its value. Right now at about 45 cents, folks, if we were to sell this hedge today, Remember what our opening credit was, okay? We had about a five cent opening credit. If we were to sell all of this, that brings us into a net credit of about 50 cents, okay? Opening five cents, adding 45 from the sale, the proceeds of the sale of the hedge. Now, whilst that may sound like good news today, why would we not be advising clients to do that immediately? Well, again, SPX, if I bring you into the watch list, here we go. Now, this is a little monitor window on the bottom left. SPX is the second one from the top. 2293 is where we're at right now, uh, or about 229 on Spider. So we're about $9 out of the money, okay, just under $9 out of the money on this. And we do still have quite a few days left. Do we want to be in a situation where we've got quite a number of days remaining to expiry but no hedge? Well, no, that's certainly not the purpose here. The whole concept of hedging one by three is to allow you to bring both positions as close to the expiry as you can whilst still being in a scenario where you can get a net credit, okay? That means that whenever you sell the hedge, proceeds move you into that net credit scenario. That's the whole concept here of a one by three. And this is where you have to balance both sides, okay? Your short put spreads and how much they are declining in value against the hedge value. You know that the delta, as you, as you can see, is much lower on the premium you've sold. So the hedge is actually going to work much faster for you if you do get a sell-off. But again, as you can see today, um, I mentioned earlier, the Dow is above 20,000 for the first time, FPX uh, also at all-time highs. The problem, folks, in the past few weeks during November, December, and January is that as FPX has continued to move higher, it means that we find ourselves having to adjust the hedge much sooner than we anticipated. Now, 
that is to a certain extent a, um, a disadvantage, but it, it still allows us to extract the credit. Okay, we can still allow this hedge to lose a lot of its value from our cost basis of 70 cents and have a scenario where we've extracted premium at some point before the expiry. Okay, now, again, 16 days to expiry here. We're not going to be in a situation where we're going to sell this hedge today, but it's something that you need to follow, following the values of both, knowing where your break-even is. In this case, we've got a relatively healthy break-even because it's actually a positive. As I mentioned, it's an opening net credit of a few cents, but that's not always the case, folks. Um, in some cases, you will have a opening net debit, in which case you know you've paid more for the hedge, but you can allow the hedge to decline in value to a certain point as well. Possible adjustments here, folks. Well, possible adjustments involve selling a portion of the hedge. Okay. Now, just bear in mind that these are the number of contracts we sold on Spider um, for, uh, very briefly, for a number of client accounts. Okay. Um, you can disregard the client account info, but that's basically what we've done: an allocation of a number of contracts to each of our client accounts on the strategy. So the one by three, um, as I mentioned, it's great for uh, markets that really don't have too much direction. If the market continues to move higher, which it doesn't do on an infinite basis, infinite basis, but if it is moving higher over several weeks, then you find yourself in a scenario where you do have to, um, uh, to uh, realize your, your value and your hedge sooner than expected. If we were to sell this hedge today, as I mentioned, folks, we still have quite a number of days to expiry before these put spreads expire into the money with no downside protection. The whole concept here is to protect your downside and, as I mentioned, participate in a modest pullback in SPX because if you do get a modest pullback, that's where this hedge will really start to work for you. Okay? Question here from DG. Uh, why would we trade Spider and pay so high commissions than SPX? Well, folks, I, I've talked a lot about this in previous webcasts the comparisons between both, but very simply, DG, if you take a look at the bid ask, okay, here's the major benefit of spider ETF options. Take a look at how narrow the bid offer is. Folks, that's 46 at 48, 45 at 47, okay? So we are within a penny of, of the, bid ask, the bid ask. That means we're not really losing that much. We're paying very little to the market to adjust positions or to move in and out of position. That's exactly what you want because you've got a very high degree of efficiency in the bid offer. Lots of liquidity being provided by a lot of market makers. We can easily move in and out of positions. Yes, it does mean a larger number of contracts, but folks, you factor that in. Before you start to sell premium, you factor in what your net premium will be, net of the commissions. That's a very simple task, okay? So again, two cent bid offer, that means that we are within the, the, uh, the bid ask in most occasions, that's exactly what we wanna see. Folks, over in SPX, Okay, that's the Fed 10, 221, 226 that I was showing you. Let's briefly take a look at this same position. 221, 226, which of course is on SPX. That's going to be 2260. Uh, I'm going to do this very quickly for all of you on the Fed 10 expiry against the 2210, which is right there. Okay, so here we are. We're going to add that. And what do you know? 420 at 460, folks. That's a 40 cent spread. Okay, 30 cents now, which is three cents wide. Now, that's not always gonna be the case. In some cases, folks, you're gonna get a wider bid offer. You could see four at five or perhaps 410 at 490. Ask yourself the question, do you wanna be giving back so much of your premium because of the fact that you don't know where the market is? You know where the mid market is, certainly, but trying to get done at mid market, folks, well, uh, of course, that's trial and error. Uh, use limit orders as we always advise our clients and we always use limit orders as well. But take a look, it's 40 cents wide, that's four cents on Spider. If we go back to Spider, as I mentioned, we are within two cents. Okay, so DJ, I hope that answers your question. Yes, there are advantages to SPX as well because of the notional size, it's 10 times larger, um, but you have to balance the, the benefits of both products, okay? I can tell you folks, um, the performance I talked about um, in my PowerPoint presentation for 2016, that's entirely based on Spider, nothing to do with SPX, okay? And also, as I mentioned, it is net of a 2.5% annual management fee, uh, but gross of a 20% year-end performance fee, okay? It is also net of commissions as well. As I mentioned, when I bring you back to the presentation, you can request 
the full brokerage account statement for what we've just uh, what we've just talked about. Okay. So, folks, this is the ID platform. As I mentioned, that's one example of what we've got right now um, on Fed 10 expiry. Uh, as I mentioned, um, it's well, a one by three right now. But if we do see continued moves higher on SPX, then it's likely that we will start to offload this um, with a, a healthy credit. Okay. All right. Let me bring you back into the platform. Okay, so that's what we talked about, this one by three, and that's what the P&L looks like, okay? Um, with, regards to, uh, with regards to the one by three setup, as I mentioned, I've just given you an example of how that works in, uh, in the platform. Again, the other thing to bear in mind, folks, is that's on the put spread side. You can also do the same on a call spread side. That means one by three call spreads. Here, in this example, we're looking to take a relatively neutral to bearish outlook. As I mentioned, we're at all-time highs now. Some of you may be look, willing to step in and sell call spread premium on the front month on SPX or Spider. Um, if that's the case, folks, bear in mind that because volatility is below 11 right now on the VIX, the amount of premium we're going to bring in is going to be pretty negligible. Okay, as I mentioned, um, because the fact volatility is so low, that's affecting premiums everywhere. Remember the old phrase, that when all, uh, whenever the, uh, the tide comes in, all the boats rise. Uh, whenever the tide goes out, all the boats will fall, okay? That, that's really what, uh, what volatility does to option pricing, okay? So, folks, this is more of a basic level uh, slide, uh, these couple of slides. I'll skip through those because, as I mentioned, I know a lot of you are more in the intermediate level. These are part of the presentation. Some important things about the credit spread overall, and, again, why we're going to continue to focus on it based on this performance that I talked about earlier. This, this is the 2016 performance, as I mentioned. The cumulative return is over on the right. That's 50.48% with the benchmark comparison. Over on the left being the green line against the blue line is the strategy performance. Okay, so our target for this year is about 40%, folks. This is on our firm trading account. This is entirely a firm trading account using firm assets. Okay, so as I mentioned, some points on the credit spread. It's really an income-seeking strategy, but it's not the only one out there. Um, Tom mentioned to me before we started today that a lot of you are butterfly folks, so that you are, I'm assuming that you're familiar with the whole approach of harvesting premium and taking market-neutral strategies. The credit spread on its own is great for certain market conditions, but remember that it, it's not a directional strategy. Some of you are looking to be aggressive on direction. You want to be a buyer of gamma, as I mentioned. Um, and of course, if you do get a breakout one way or the other, you should benefit more than a seller of a premium. But as I mentioned also, a very important fact, about 80% of options expire, listed options expire out of the money. Okay. Uh, John is asking, are all of your trades done at about three weeks out? Uh, John, that's a good question. Time horizon is a great thing. It's a fixed um, question that we get all the time actually in our webinars. It varies based on our time horizon and our outlook for the market. We can use the weeklies, the monthlies, or the back months, uh, John, depending on what we're trying to achieve. What we normally do is when we've got a significant sell-off, we like to sell back month premium um, much further out of the money and look to hedge that nearer term. Okay, so a similar one by three setup, but perhaps not using the same expiry, using a nearer term time horizon for the hedge. Okay? Okay, so you can see the, the points about... Uh, the credit spread that I've talked about. Uh, DG is asking now, uh, do we trade these credit spreads? Let's see. Uh, John is asking, do these credit spreads each month, no matter how the volatility is? Uh, if no, then do you not make money in certain months? Okay, so John is asking about how frequently we trade these credit spreads. Folks, this is a continuous strategy. Okay, um, you can see here, on, on the, if I briefly bring you back into this, the blue line is a strategy performance. There is no break in that strategy performance. It's a continuous path-dependent strategy using the mid-weeklies, the weeklies, and the traditional monthlies. Okay. Now, of course, if market conditions became exceptional, uh, there may be a scenario where we lighten up on positions um, and we focus entirely on very far to the money back month time horizon okay, as opposed to weeklies. Uh, Ian is asking, could you comment briefly on the second half dip in profits? Um, well, Ian, if you think about it, it wasn't actually Brexit. Um, let me just zoom in briefly, folks, 
for you. Uh, this is a zoom in chart. Take a look, folks. The Brexit right around here. Yeah, right around there. That's Brexit. You can see, uh, in fact, hang on. Uh, it's actually further over, folks. Here we are. Uh, that's the little blip there on the sell off on SPX. That's our strategy performance. Um, it's actually, folks, what happened in early September uh, where we had to roll out uh, and roll down on the, uh, on the strategy. That's more where the upset in the performance came, came about. But as I mentioned, we recovered all of that to finish the year at the highs of about 50.4%. Okay. Um, Mohit is asking, do we do any back test? No, Mohit, we do not back test anything. Folks, we are only interested in one thing here at IUR, and that's real actual performance, which is exactly what I'm showing you here uh, on the screen. And in fact, folks, what I can do is um, I can provide a, yeah, let's take a look. I can give you the full brokerage account statement um, in this WebEx. And again, you can access that as well uh, after today's webinar. Let me just uh, take a look at this. Here we go. Uh, it's this one right here, folks. Okay, there's a separate slide loading for you. Uh, here we go. Okay, so a separate slide is loading, folks. This is the brokerage account statement for um, for the SPX credit spread strategy. Uh, here we go. Yeah. Okay, um, apologies. That's just the um, that's just a. a Uh, there is a folks a separate one that I'm going to give you. Bear with me one second. Okay, I'm going to get into the, the WebEx now for all of you. Here we go. Okay, I'll, I'll take this one off, folks. And make sure we don't have any duplicates. Okay, and this one as well. And then I'll give you the full uh, brokerage account statement. Here we go. This one. Okay, so I'm loading the full brokerage account statement into the WebEx. This gives you both the snapshot of the performance and the uh, the actual trading account statement for the entire year. It is quite a big document. Um, if you're not able to download it, whenever I make it available here in WebEx, you can request it from me after. Here we go. Yeah, Gareth, if you like, you can just uh, email those to me, and I'll make them available okay, with the yeah. recording. Yeah, even better, yeah. Okay. All right, folks, we'll do that after uh, because it is a quite a big document. Um, all right, now a couple of other questions here I'll get to before we finish up. Uh, let's see. Um, Mohit is asking, what returns can I expect on the drawdowns? Mohit, it's probably best if you have a chat with me uh, after uh, today's event. Um, folks, what I will do here is um, uh, my email address is in the chat panel. Um, if you want to request a slide and also have a chat with me after um, uh, today's webinar, Ian, uh, for you also, um, Ian, if you are interested in the performance breakdown uh, for 2016 and our target for 2017, you can uh, drop me an email after as well. As I mentioned, the slides are available uh, as well. Folks, this is a brief background of what we do in terms of our advisory on this particular credit spread strategy for, uh, for our clients on the Interactive Brokers platform. You can see exactly uh, what's involved with that. Um, as I mentioned, our target for this year is about 40% on that credit spread strategy after doing 50% last year. These targets are net of fees and commissions. Okay, uh, the performance that we've discussed relates to an IUR firm proprietary account. You should not assume that the, the performance we talked about today uh, will be repeated or that any client account has the same performance uh, that we have reported as well. Okay, um, performance will also vary based, of course, on several factors for each client, including you, uh, your risk profile, your financial circumstances, and other things as well. So that's, of course, what we would need to talk to you about. Moment is asking um, about, yes, so our managed options account and our advisor account. Folks, we offer both. Mohit, if I can ask you, uh, Mohit, to drop me an email after, and we can have a chat with you on that. Folks, here's my email once again. 
um, with regards to uh, what we've talked about today. Um, John is also, also asking about commissions. Uh, John, based on volumes, that's what commissions are based on. Um, John, if you want to shoot me an email after as well, we can have a chat about volumes relative to uh, what we do, folks. We do a significant amount of volume um, every month uh, on, uh, on US options, in particular index options. Okay, so John, you can reach out to me after today's event. Folks, once again, that's my email address. Uh, we have run over time a little bit today, but I do hope uh, most of you have uh, picked up a few things. Um, once again, I'll ask all of you to reach out to me um, after today's event. Um, I believe that uh, Tom is also going to provide me with the, uh, the list for everyone that's come along today, so I will um, give you all a follow-up email in any case uh, shortly after. Okay, once again, folks, I'm going to give it back to Tom, but I look forward to um, being on another webcast very soon with Capital Discussions. Thanks, Garrett. Appreciate it, and um, nice presentation. And uh, I'll, uh, like I said, just email me those documents. I'll get them with the recording, and I'll get you a list of um, who came, and we'll uh, we'll go from there. So thanks very much. I look forward to having you in the future. Great. Speak to you all soon, folks. All right. Take care.